Ah, okay. We've already seen one quote this morning from Drew Faust from Harvard University. I'm starting today with another, a quote also from Lord Deering, uh, a very prominent advocate of higher education in the House of Lords in the United Kingdom, and from a report from Thomson Reuters on the development of the BRIC nations. I won't read the quotes, you can all read those for yourselves, but I think there's an important take-home message in that, and that is for universities to question what their real role is in the 21st century. Traditionally, we've turned out great thinkers, we've turned out people who can question our societies and the directions that they're going in. But perhaps universities have been criticised for really not turning out the type of graduates that business and industry needs to succeed. I think in today's world that's no longer tenable. And I think the quotes that you see before you from such eminent people really demonstrate that to be the case. I want to take a particular example of how the university that I worked at before I came to Sunway was looking at the human capital needs of its region and trying to address some of the fundamental problems that that region faced. And although that region was in Wales in the United Kingdom, uh, sorry, I've put back the... Technology. Yes. What were you saying about learning to use these things? Um, although it's 7,000 miles away, I think there are a number of analogies that are very pertinent to Southeast Asia and perhaps to Malaysia in particular. The area of the UK that I'm talking about is Wales, and in particular, the top northeast corner of Wales. Very close to Liverpool and Manchester, major economic powerhouses in their own right. And Wales really had some major issues to deal with in terms of trying to compete with those areas as well as the rest of the UK and the rest of the world. This just focuses a little more on the region itself. Um, the three areas that I've shown are three counties similar to states here in Malaysia. And the figures in the circles show the proportion of people employed in manufacturing. In Flintshire, that figure now is, is a little bit higher than that. It's closer to 35%. It's the highest proportion of manufacturing-based jobs anywhere in the UK, and one of the highest in Europe. But those manufacturing jobs are very low-skilled jobs. The products and services are very low-value-added jobs. The proportion of graduates in the workforce is very low, at least comparatively. Perhaps in parts of Southeast Asia it's a lot higher, but certainly in terms of Western Europe, the proportion of graduates are very low. The consequence of those low-value-added products, low-skilled workforce, is that wages are low, the value added, the gross value added product of the region is really quite low. These are major issues that the region was having to deal with. And the reason it was having to deal with those issues was because low value manufacturing was hemorrhaging away from Western Europe, the United States. Wales was competing as a low-wage economy. It simply cannot do that in the future. In worldwide standards, the wages are high in Wales, although compared to the rest of the UK and Western Europe, they were low. They're still high in worldwide standards. And there is simply no way that low-value manufacturing is sustainable in Wales. And I think you can see the trend up to uh, 2015 are going to be actual figures. So there's been a very significant downward trend in the jobs. 
about 40 to 50 per cent of jobs will have been lost over a 20 year period. The challenge for Wales is to turn that round. The challenge for Wales was to move from a low value added, low wage economy, low skilled economy, to a high value added, high wage, high skilled economy. And hopefully to turn that trend around and increase the number of jobs in manufacturing. Of course, it's not simply about taking the businesses that are already there and helping them to produce higher value goods, to provide them with a greater human capital to produce them, because as we all know, generally speaking, higher value goods actually take fewer people to produce. So it isn't just about working with the industry that's there, it's about thinking of ways of attracting particularly foreign, but any inward investment into the region. So how do we move up the value added chain? And I think this really comes to the heart of my thesis, and that is universities cannot and should not try to do this alone. We often hear people talking about the triple helix of universities, business and government. Indeed, we now hear people talking about the quadruple helix, and I've even heard people extend it further. But I think the important point is that it has to be a partnership. There is no point in universities turning out high-skilled undergraduates to go into these jobs if there are not the jobs for them. They will just hemorrhage away and that will not solve the region's problems of low skilled workforce, low wages and a declining economy. So universities must work in tandem with industry and with government to ensure that the industry and business there can really move up the value added chain. And that is about research and development as much as it is about undergraduate teaching, as important as we heard from Tantri of getting that right. They have to have the jobs to go on to. So I think moving up the value added chain, moving from a low value added economy, a low wage economy, into a high skill, high value added, high wage economy, is about a relationship between universities and industry and governments who have to set the policy context and I think have to help support with the right kind of funding as well in order to achieve that virtuous circle where our businesses are able to create the products and services that we are prepared to pay more money for and that then the universities are supplying that human capital that those industries need. There's a very interesting statistic, and that is to look at the number of graduates a country has against how innovative that country is. And I don't think that it's any surprise that countries that have a higher proportion of graduates tend to have a much higher proportion of innovation within their industry. This is a virtuous circle and as I say, although Wales is 7,000 miles away, I think many of the issues that the Welsh economy faces are similar to the ones that we face here in Malaysia and indeed across the Southeast Asian region as a whole. I've said much of what's already on this slide, it really summarises, but there are a couple of things that I want to, to pull out. No university today can do it on its own, even working with business and government. Universities, I think, have a huge role to play in globalisation. Academics have, for the last 130 or so years, published papers. Those have been published and distributed increasingly around the world. We have opened ourselves up to critical comment and analysis from our colleagues around the world. Universities have a vast network of colleagues and collaborators. 
At Sunway University, we're trying to build links, of course, with Harvard and the chair in Southeast Asian Studies, endowed by Tantri Jeffrey Chia. We're working with Lancaster University in the UK. Tomorrow, I have to go to a meeting where we've got some visitors from a university from Taiwan. Even small new universities like Sunway have vast international networks. And although each individual university on its own may not have all the answers to the problems that are out there, we do have a network. And I think it's very important as we think about how we develop our human capital that we build on that network and collaborate more with our colleagues around the world. Globalization, to my mind, is absolutely central to growth. Without it, I don't think that we can have the kind of growth that we're looking for. Oops. Ah. So that's some basic underlying principles. What did we actually do in Wales to try and address some of these issues? Wales is predominantly a manufacturing-based economy, as I've said, and it's largely dominated by the aerospace and automotive sectors. Traditionally, both of those sectors have involved metal bashing. Airbus has a huge factory employing about 8,000 people um, in Flintshire. It's Flintshire's single largest employer. It builds all of the wings for Airbus's commercial fleet from the A380 down. The vast majority of that work is work that someone from the 1940s or 50s would have recognised. It's taking bits of metal, drilling holes in them and riveting them together. That is very low value added work, it's very unskilled work. And frankly, Airbus could make those wings a lot cheaper anywhere else in the world. And they had started to do so. And Flintshire asked itself this key question, how do we move forward? How do we move from doing what we're doing into the next economy for aviation? And that's basically in the area of composites. Modern aircraft now are increasingly built of carbon fibre. The new Airbus A350, which will come on stream shortly, has about 45% carbon fibre. That compares to something like an A320, which has about 5% carbon fibre. Carbon fibre involves a completely new way of working, new technologies, new cultures in the workplace. It's not just true of aviation and defence, it's also true of the automotive world. That's moving into a much more new smart materials type area. Just to give you some idea of the, the value of the aviation industry to, to Wales, it's about four billion per annum, over, per annum of sales. That's about 20% of the UK market as a whole and the UK is second only to the US. There are over 160 aerospace companies in Wales with six of the world's top ten. Companies like EADS, BAE Systems, Airbus, General Electric and so on. And not just those companies, but of course they're supply chain companies as well. And I think that's another important point to make. You cannot survive on just the large-scale manufacturers. Increasingly, economies are recognising the need to attract the supply chain and to create manufacturing clusters which can support and grow with each other. And I think that's another very important aspect that universities can help, and that is to create the kind of environment where the smaller supply chain companies can prosper. Because they do very much focus on the higher skills, they are very much focused on smaller components but high value added components. But they can work more closely than they do with their 
end users, in this case Airbus, General Electric and companies like that. Universities can help to facilitate that because they are very good at being able to operate in a kind of open innovation environment. And I think that's my third key point from this morning, and that is universities have to strive to create a much more open innovation environment where businesses can safely talk about the problems that they've got and universities can help them to solve it. Business, of course, will not share its problems with other businesses, but they will share them with universities and universities will know what their problems are, they will know what other businesses' problems are, and they can help to bring those businesses together within the university environment so that those businesses can work together safely without their problems being known by their competitors. So I think that's another key area in which universities can focus. So what exactly did we do? As a university, we got together primarily with Airbus, but also with a number of other manufacturing companies in the region. Toyota was one of them. Raytheon was another. We got together with them and the Welsh Government, and we first of all said, let's have a look at what the real problems are. Let us understand business why you are struggling to bridge this gap into the higher value added area and let us help to provide those solutions for you. In other words, what academics did was go into industry, look at the problems and help them to find solutions. And that's helping the industry to produce higher value added products at the cutting edge. But equally importantly, and particularly thinking about the human capital arena that we're talking about this morning, and that is that as a university, we wanted to invite industry into the university to help us teach the undergraduates, to help us understand what the skills were that they needed and help us to deliver the kind of skills that those industries needed. So we created an environment, in this particular case a physical centre located in a manufacturing park where these businesses were located. We created a physical centre that took students from further education all the way through up to master's level and degree level in one environment, working with industry to solve industry's problems and to provide the human capital that they need. It's been an extremely successful collaboration. Airbus at Broughton have won a contract now to build the next generation of wings, all based on composite technology, which will secure 8,000 jobs for the next 10 to 15 years. The university has prospered because the number of undergraduates coming through has increased and those undergraduates are getting high-skilled, high-paid jobs within the region. So this is just one example of how universities working together with industry and yes with government because they have to set the policy context and they also have to provide funding to support some of these ventures but how working together I think we can begin to address the kind of human capital problems that Southeast Asia has got if it wants to move from its current middle income trap into a high wage, high value added economy. Thank you.